Hello and welcome. This is the AP Physics 1 review video for Unit 5 Momentum. As always, we'll be covering both free response questions and multiple choice questions. All of those are linked on a document in the description below, as will be this PowerPoint with all the work on it. But none of the content is here because all of that can be found on AP Classroom's daily videos. And with that, let's get into our first problem. A car of mass M traveling at speed V stops in time T when maximum braking force is applied. Assuming the braking force is independent of mass, what time would be required to stop a car of mass 2m traveling at speed v? Well, we see that we have a mass, and a velocity, and a time, and a force. Right? And that makes me think of it as impulse. Right? Impulse, the change in momentum. Don't know why they made it a p. Um, it's also equal to j, which is the variable for impulse. I also don't know why, why they made that variable j, but this is equal to mass and velocity, mass and velocity, and force and time. Right now, what can we do with this? Well, if we ignore this part of the equation for a second, and we just focus on this right, mv equals ft, then they're saying in this new set of conditions, we have 2m traveling at the same speed v, and it's, what are they saying? They're saying that the braking force is independent of mass. Well, all that really means is that its constant doesn't change, right? It doesn't change between these two conditions, so it's just same f, and they're asking us how much time, so like what goes in these parentheses? And I think it's pretty obvious that if you just put 2t in here, right, it, it, it's, it's still equal because it's just, you double this, right, you double both sides of this equation to get that. Your answer would be 2t, twice the time. That is answer choice d. Let's keep going. A block of mass m is initially at rest on a frictionless floor. The block attached to a massless spring with spring constant k is initially at its equilibrium position. An arrow with mass m and velocity v is shot into the block. The arrow sticks in the block. What is the maximum compression of the spring? All right, so let's draw out. Let's draw out what's going on in this position. So we have here's our block with mass m. Right, and let, let's just draw a spring. At least try to. Right, that, that's that's like a spring, kind of. And this is at rest, right? It's not moving. So this has no momentum. But then you also have this arrow over here, right? That has mass m and is moving with velocity v. So the total momentum for the system is the momentum for the system is m v. And then the arrow sticks in the block, so they become one object. So their mass is little m plus big m. So we can do this. This is an inelastic collision. m plus little m. That will be our velocity at the end. All right, so it'll be. Then we can take this squared and this squared. And why can we do that? Because now we can find kinetic energy, right? Because when this arrow hits the block, we're told that it's at its equilibrium position. The equilibrium position of a spring is always where it has its maximum kinetic energy. And its maximum displacement, maximum compression, is where it has no kinetic energy. All of its energy is spring potential energy. Right, so we have mv squared times little m plus, over uh, mv squared divided by little m plus big m squared times the mass is m, little m plus big m, right, times one half, times one half, right, so uh, this will cancel with one of the factors in the denominator, and make that, and that will be equal to the spring force at the maximum compression, so I will call that spring force, I mean, we'll call the maximum compression d, and it would become one half k 
Okay. Wait, right? That's the maximum. As soon as it's just reinforced at the maximum displacement. If we can cross the one half out on both sides. And then we have a k. You can divide by k. So that goes there. Right, this is just simple algebra. And then uh, we just want to take the square root of this. Right, to get rid of that 2. So we take square root of that. We take the square root of that. We can just mv. Take square root of the denominator and it becomes the square root of all of that stuff. So d equals mv over the square root of k times little m plus big M. Looking at our choices, that looks like answer choice d, and that is our answer. Let's keep going. All right, a spring is compressed between two objects with unequal masses, little m and big M, and held together. The objects are initially at rest on a horizontal frictionless surface. When released, which of the following is true? Well. Let's see. At before anything happens, right? This is initially at rest, so it has no momentum. And when it's released, it doesn't. I think the key thing here is that when it's released, there's no work. Right? There is no work being done on the system. Right? All the energy, all the momentum it has is conserved. Right? And because of that. They had no momentum at the end, so your net momentum should be zero at the end, right? Even though the, these two blocks are going to be like shooting off in opposite directions, right? That makes that the total final kinetic energy is not going to be zero because kinetic energy is scalar, right? The two objects might not is not going to have equal kinetic energy because that because they're going to have the same momentum because that would conserve momentum. And if you have the same momentum with different masses, then the velocity is not the same, and kinetic energy is not going to end up being the same. Uh, this, if the speed of one object is equal to the speed of the other, it's also not going to happen. If your masses are different, and the momentum is the same, your velocity is not going to be the same. And the total final momentum of the two objects is zero. That is our answer, because momentum is conserved, and the net momentum at the end will be zero. Right? The, the best way to, like, actually think about this problem is that what is like when you when the spring is compressed and when the spring is compressed it has that spring force right it has that spring energy and that spring energy is then being translated into kinetic energy you're not adding energy right you're not adding forces or you're not adding momentum so therefore you cannot have any other different momentum than you had at the beginning so therefore it must be no momentum no net momentum at the end these two objects are still going to have their own separate momentums that are going to be decently large when they go shooting off in opposite directions. But their, the sum of those vectors is going to be zero. And our answer is D. Let's move on. Two football players, mass 75 kilograms and 100 kilograms, run directly towards each other with speeds of 6 meters per second and 8 meters per second, respectively. They grab each other as they collide. The combined speed of the two players just after the collision would be what? Well, the first thing I notice is that it, the question tells us that they grab each other as they collide. Right? That's an inelastic collision, right? If there are two objects, they crash into each other, and now it's one object. Right? So if we draw a diagram for this, right? So this is our 75 kilogram person, and then they go at 6 meters per second. So right here they have 450 momentum units, right? Now I just I just said momentum units, and like the correct units would be kilogram meters per second or newton second, but I can kind of skip over that because they've given us the same units throughout the entire problem, right? Kilograms, kilograms, meters per second, meters per second. If they give you different units, it's obviously very important to write the units out so you don't get confused. But since like we really only have one unit and that's going to be the momentum units then we really don't care about the units right so we don't need to write them out everywhere and moving on we can do the same thing with the 100 kilogram person at eight meters per second and that gives 800 momentum units 
and therefore the net momentum would be 350 momentum units in that direction. So now we just have 350 right, kilograms meter per second over 75 plus 100 kilograms, the right, total mass, and that would equal 2 meters per second. So our answer is A. Let's move on. A 5,000 kilogram freight car moving at 4 kilometers per hour collides and couples with, again, inelastic collision, right? With an 8,000 kilogram freight car, which is initially at rest. The approximate common final speed of these two cars is what? Well, it's kind of, this, it's basically the same problem, except one of the cars is not even moving, right? So if you have this 5,000, right, 5k and 8k and this one's going at 4 kilometers per hour and remember that these units are like kilo, kilometers per hour is not a standard unit but that's what the but that's what the quest is asking for and that's what the answers are provided in for so there's no conversion necessary so we still have the same units the whole time right and then this way is just so there is no vector really so you end up with 20k going that way, going to the right, over that the sum of those masses, right, which is 13k, 13k, and that is 1.54 when you put that into a calculator, which is answer choice C. Let's keep going. Rubber ball is held motionless, a height h naught above a hard floor and released. Assuming that the collision with the floor is elastic, which one of the following graphs best shows the relationship between the total energy E of the ball and its height h above the surface? Alright, so we can see in all of these graphs, right? Like, the first thing we notice is that is the middle, right? The middle when it hits the ground. Right, what happens? Well, the collision is elastic, meaning that when it hits the ground, right, when it, when it hits the ground and it comes back up, it's going to have the same kinetic energy, right? And since it's the same ball, it's going to end up with the same velocity, right? Which means, yeah, same kinetic energy, same, same of all energy. So we're not going to see a big jump in energy, which, of course, we can see that fulfills all of the graphs, that doesn't really help. But what we can notice is that we, we just need to figure out how the ball's energy changes as it goes down or as it comes back up. Right, as the ball goes down, is it gaining or is it losing energy? Well, the answer is that it's not really doing either of those, right? Like if you drop a ball, it's not going to suddenly, like nothing is doing work on that ball. Right, except for air resistance, but we don't care about that, right? So nothing is doing work on the ball. The ball is not gaining or losing energy. It is just transforming its potential energy that it had before into kinetic energy to move faster. Right? So even though velocity is going to increase, even though height will decrease, no, none of the energy is actually being lost or gained. So you're going to end up with the same energy you had the whole time. Therefore, it's going, you're going to have the same energy yeah, for the entire span of the graph, and that is answer choice A. Let us move on. A mass M has speed V, collides with a stationary object of mass 2M. If both objects stick together in a perfectly inelastic collision, what is the final speed of the newly formed object? Well, you have a momentum vector of MV going to the right. You have this 2M just sitting over here, right? just no no momentum at all they collide they have 3m mass now but they still have the same momentum right mv as before and that would be right, cross out the m and we get v over 3 as the final speed of the newly formed object and that is answer choice a keep going a student initially wait no we skipped one 
A 50 kilogram skater at rest on a frictionless rink throws a 2 kilogram ball, giving a ball a velocity of 10 meters per second. Which statement describes the skater's subsequent motion? All right, let's think about this, right? Because it, it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Like if you throw something, you're not going to go flying back in the opposite direction, right? We know that. But I think the best way to understand what's going on here is just imagine like you're in space because in space, there's no other forces. So it's kind of easy to think about what's going on, right? So if you're in space and you're just like sitting there at rest, not moving, and then you throw something, right? Suddenly, that thing that you threw, right, has a has momentum going in this direction, right? It might be a small momentum because it has a small mass, but it still has some momentum, right? And then I'll just draw a stick figure person. Right here is you, the person who threw the ball. And now the total momentum before was just like, zero right it wasn't it wasn't anything because you're just putting in the same spot so it has to be the same after because there's nothing to add momentum to because you're in space right so it would be a momentum vector going this way so you'd be going in the opposite direction the momentum vectors would be the same the velocity is not going to be the same but you do have the same magnitude of momentum so you're going to go in the opposite direction first off so A and C can be crossed out. But second off, right, this 2 kilogram ball times 10 meters per second is going to have 20 right, kilograms meter per second. This is going to be 50 kilograms. So to make this so to make this side 20 kilograms meter per second, it has to be 20 over 50 meters per second or 0 0.4 meters per second in the opposite direction and the answer is b right, let's move on again don't know why i'm skipping problems uh this is kind of a similar problem right it's an screw initially at rest on a frictionless frozen pond there was a one kilogram hammer in one direction after the throw the hammer moves off in one direction while screw moves off in the other direction which of the following correctly describes the about situation well, let's remember uh, here it says you're at rest, right? Not moving before. So there's not going to be any net momentum after. So you have the person is that object. The hammer is that. They both go off craning in different directions. Uh, but they're going, the vectors are going to have the same magnitude of momentum so that they cancel out and produce a final momentum of nothing, zero. So they're not, neither of them are going to be greater than the other. So we can cross those two out. And now we have to deal with kinetic energy. Now if you remember back to one of these problems, right? One of these problems, this one, right? This is the problem we're going to get to in like the next problem, right? But just let's look at this problem for a second. And we can figure this out and then go back to that problem because this problem is really interesting in how it applies to that problem. So these two objects have the same momentum, right? So let's write out what, what that means, right? So MP times VP equals MQ VQ. And they're saying that Q has more kinetic energy than P if, right? So one half MP vp squared is supposed to be less than one half mq vq squared if what and the first thing we need to just cross this out and then notice that if we divide this left side by this left side mp vp it's going to be the same as if we divide that side by mq vq right so that's going to be inequality since this is an equality, we can divide by that and make VQ is greater than VP. So the answer to this question is that Q is going to have more speed than P. But that's not it, right? Because notice here that if MP VP equals MQ VQ and VQ is bigger than VP, then MP needs to be bigger 
then then m u right to make sure that the momentum is equal so the the one with the less momentum less uh less mass right object q is going to end up with more kinetic energy because the less mass means more velocity and velocity is dominant in kinetic energy because it's squared now going back to this question right how does that help with this question? Well, we're talking about kinetic energy. And which one has the right kinetic energy in a situation where the magnitudes are equal? Well, this one kilogram hammer has less mass than the student. That means the one kilogram hammer is going to go faster than the student. And since velocity is dominant again, it will have the greater kinetic energy. So the answer will be answer choice C. Let's move on. All right, here we have an explosion. Stationary object explodes, breaking into three pieces of masses M, M, and 3M. The two pieces of mass M move off at right angles to each other with the same magnitude of momentum MV as shown in the diagram above. What are the magnitude and direction of the velocity of the piece having mass 3M? So the first thing we can do is start drawing out these vectors. All right, so this is our first vector of uh, the MV. This is our second vector, right, also mv. Which means that if we draw the summation of these two vectors, right, like that, this is our 90 degree angles and equal to each other, this is going to end up being mv root 2. mv root 2. Right, but that's that vector going in that direction, right? Well, we want, we don't want this vector. Right? We want the vector going here. So it, cancel, it can cancel out the resultant vector to make sure that the, uh, the object has no momentum at the end because at the beginning, the stationary. Is, the stationary, right? So there was no momentum at the beginning, so there should be no net momentum at the end. So this also has to have a also has to have mv squared of 2 momentum at the end but then we this has mass 3m this piece has mass 3m so dividing by 3m we cross the m's out and we get v squared of 2 over 3 v squared of 2 over 3 that is either choice c or choice d but we can see that our vector is pointed down and to, it's pointing down and to the left, which is just like answer choice D. So that is our answer. And we are moving on. All right. This is our last multiple choice question. And it is, how does an air mattress protect a stunt person landing on the ground after a stunt? All right. So this is a, this is like a really, this is a question that is, really popular on the AP exam because it's kind of the only theoretical part of this entire unit. And what it, what what you have to think about when you see this is uh, it, it's semi-quantitative reasoning, right? So you just have to think about the formulas in terms of, uh, well, if I change this variable, what happens to the rest of the variables, right? Now here, this is a question about impulse, right? So we can draw the formula for impulse again, right? The, Delta P equals MV equals force times time. All right, then we get rid of this, obviously, because we don't need that. And then, so we have MV equals force times time, right? Now, no matter what you do, M and V are not going to change, right? Like, the mass of the person is not going to suddenly change. And if you, if you like, increase, or if you jump off the same building or... If you let, if you just like jump off from the same height, you're gonna end up with the same velocity no matter what you do, right? So this is just going to be like a constant, right? Some constant, which just means that F T is going to also be some constant. What what does that mean, right? Like how does that apply? And that applies, right? Let, let's think about let's think about like how this air mattress works, right? So what is why do we use an air mattress, right? And um, we can compare that to like concrete, right? Now that's what you'd usually land on if you didn't have an air mattress. If you land on concrete, right? It's just like 
you just you land there, you smack it, that's it, right? Like on an air mattress, it's going to bend back, it's going to creep, right? And it's going to give you more time when you hit the ground. It's going to bend a bit and then come back up. It gives you more time, right? It's the same principle that probably all of you used as a kid, like when you jumped off a bunch of stairs or something, right? Like if you jump off a bunch of stairs, like like from a really from enough height, and if you just jump when you hit the floor, you're not you're not usually just going to like stand there with your legs straight. What you usually do is you bend your knees as you hit the ground. Same thing that parkour people do, right? They bend their knees when they hit the ground, or they roll over. Well, what's the point of that? It increases the amount of time before you come to a stop, right? When you increase the amount of time that you come to a stop. That decreases the force. Why? Because this is a constant, right? It's a constant. So F and T are inversely proportional. If you increase one, the other decreases. When you do all of that stuff, right? When you bend your knees or when you roll, right? Or when you jump on an air mattress that bends, you're increasing the stopping time. You're increasing the time it takes for you to come to a stop, to come to rest. And that decreases the force on you. And that protects you because now you're less likely to break something. And that's why the answer is answer choice D. Let's move on to some FRQs. All right. A bullet of mass M and velocity V0 is fired toward a block of mass 4M. The block is initially at rest on a frictionless horizontal surface. The bullet penetrates the block and emerges with a velocity of V0 over 3. And asks to determine the final speed of the block for part A. All right, so let's draw a diagram of what's going on here. All right, so you have M going at V naught, and that's it, right? So M, V, that is the initial, that's like the before condition, right? And then at the end, you have M going at V over three, but that only gives you MV over three momentum. You need to have two MV over three momentum somewhere. Right, and well, the only other object to give that momentum is 4m, right? The block. If you have a, an object that's weighing 4m and you want it to have a momentum of 2mv over 3, its velocity will have to be 1 sixth v. So then the answer for part a, the final field of the block, is 1 sixth v. All right, let's go to part b. Determine the loss in kinetic energy of the bullet. All right. So we have this bullet, right? It's going from V naught, I mean, it's going from velocity V to velocity V over 3. So we can quantify its kinetic energy like this. Like 1 half M times V squared minus V over 3 squared. Right? And v squared minus v over 3 squared is going to be, oops, did not mean to erase that, all that, is going to be 8 v squared over 9, but when we divide that by 2 over here, it's going to become a 4. So 4 mv squared over 9 for part, oops. For part B, 4 mv squared over 9. And let us move on to part C. All right, determine the gain in kinetic energy of the block. Well, kind of the same principle, right? We start at, we have our 1 half, 4 m times this one sixth v squared minus well zero squared right because it started at zero so that's just going to be one sixth v squared times one half times four and that would be that would be m v squared over eighteen so that is our answer for part c. And that is the end of that free response question. Let's move on to our next free response question. All right. 
and it's in ball A of mass 0.1 kilograms is sliding at 1.4 meters per second on the horizontal tabletop of negligible friction shown above. It makes a head-on collision with a target ball B of mass 0.5 kilograms at rest on the edge of the table. As a result of the collision, the instant ball rebounds, sliding backwards at 0.70 meters per second immediately after the collision. Part A, calculate the speed of the 0.50 target ball immediately after the collision. All right, so this collision, right, is at the beginning, then we have the stationary 0.5 kilogram object, so we don't have to write it because it's stationary, but we have, we have this 0.1 kilogram object going here at 1.4 seconds, meters per second, 1.4 meters per second, and at the end, the 0.1 object, 0.1 kilogram object is going at 0.7 meters per second. So that's the change in 0.21 momentum units, right? Because this would be 0.14 momentum units going that way, but now it's 0.07 going that way. It would be 0.21 momentum units changed, and all of that would have gone into the 0.50 object. So we can divide it by the 0.5 object. And we get that the velocity, the new velocity of the five kilogram, I mean, zero point five kilogram ball, is zero point four two meters per second, and that is part A. All right, keep on going. Calculate the hor uh, sorry, the table is one point two meters above a level horizontal floor. Target ball is projected horizontally and initially strikes the floor at a horizontal displacement D from the point of collision, and they're asked us to calculate that horizontal displacement D. Well, let's see. We have a vertical distance, and we're told that the target ball is projected horizontally, so it has no vertical velocity. So we have vertical velocity, it's zero. We have a vertical distance, 1.2 meters. I'll have vertical acceleration, which is the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second. That seems like we should use a kinematics formula, right? So let's use those kinematics formulas again. We can use the one that says delta x equals v naught t plus one half a t squared. So that'd be 1.2 meters equals v naught t, but v naught is just zero, right? Because we start at zero. At this the start is zero vertical velocity, so you can just leave that term out because it cancels out. Then it's going to take one point one half times nine point eight times time squared, and time then using our calculator is going to be equal to where is it going to be equal to? Going to be equal to zero point four nine seconds. So 0 0.49 seconds times our constant horizontal velocity times the constant horizontal velocity that I found in the previous problem, right, which is times 0 0.42 meters per second is going to equal, going to equal 0 0.208 meters and that is part b let's keep going uh part c so another experiment on the same table the target ball b is replaced by target ball c of mass 0 0.1 kilograms the instant ball again slides at 1.4 meters per second as shown above left but this time makes a glancing collision with the target ball c that is at rest on the edge of the table the target ball C stri strikes the floor at point P, which is at a horizontal displacement of 0 0.15 meters from the point of collision and at a horizontal angle of 30 degrees from the x-axis, as shown above right. I'm asked to calculate the speed V of the target ball C. Well, the first thing I notice when I look at this problem is that they gave us a horizontal distance, right? They gave us a displacement to the ground, right? Uh, and what I remember about that 
I remember about the kinematic unit in general is that we never talked about mass in the kinematic unit, right? There is no place to put in like a variable for mass in all the kinematic equations, right? It doesn't depend on mass. It just depends on like the height and the acceleration and the velocity. And we have here t equals 0 0.49 seconds to hit the ground. That is regardless of mass. For this set of conditions, it will always be 0 0.49 seconds. So with 0 0.49 seconds, right, it will take 0 0.49 seconds for the ball to hit the ground. And it will travel 1.50 meters in that time. And since the horizontal velocity is constant the entire time, we can just do 1.5 over this 0.49, and we end up with 3.03 .03 meters per second. And that is the velocity of C. Let's move on to part D. All right, part D is, calculate the Y component of incident ball A's momentum immediately after the collision. Well, let's look at the before collision picture, right? Before the collision, well, C is stationary, right? Before the collision. And A is moving horizontally, right? So A, at least A is moving in the X direction. So there is no momentum in the Y direction at all, is there? Right? It's all moving in the X direction before the collision. And since momentum is conserved, it has to be the same case after the collision, which means that the instant ball of A's momentum in the Y direction has to be opposite of instant ball of C's momentum in the Y direction, so that they cancel out. So if we find the momentum for instant ball C, we just, well, we just flip it, and that is the answer for part D for instant ball's A momentum in the Y direction. So we can redraw this triangle you see here with the 30 degrees and the 1.5 meters, right? We can redraw that triangle, right? So this is 30 degrees and this is 3.03 .03 meters per second. And we can see that this side right here, that's, that's what we want, right? That's the Y component. If we take the sine 30 times 3.03, .03, we're going to get that side. And since sine 30, sine 30 is just one half, of course you could always use your calculator. That would always that would just be 1.52 meters per second, All right? 1.52 meters per second is going to be that velocity there, and 1.52 meters per second times the mass, which is 0 0.1 kilograms, is going to be 0 0.152 kilograms meters per second. That's going to be the y component of incident ball C's momentum. So it has to be the same for incident ball A's momentum because it simply has to be the opposite in the opposite direction so that they cancel out and give a net y momentum of zero just as before. So our answer is just still going to be 0 0.152 kilograms and that is it for the FRQ section and this unit review. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. I'll be back soon with Unit 6 Oscillation and Simple Harmonic Motion. But until then, see you later.